Hi class, welcome to section uh, 6.5, the next and last section of chapter 6. Today we're going to go over optimization. So um, the next section, uh, the next chapter I should say, is uh, it's pretty much a bridge between Calculus 1 and Calculus 2. So the, the there's only four videos for the next chapter, chapter 7, um, and they're going to be rather long. So just a heads up for that. Um, as far as this section goes, optimization is very, very important. Um, just like curve section, just like curve sketching, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to pull together all of the things that we've learned in Calculus 1 so far. Okay, So this is kind of the last thing that we'll cover where we're using all of our Calculus 1 material. The next chapter, Chapter 7, we do still use our Calculus stuff, obviously. We're always going to use it. Um, from this point on, right? But it's sort of bridging the gap between Calculus 1 and Calculus 2, and we're going to do more introductory Calculus 2 stuff in the next section, although it is still considered Calculus 1 stuff because it is, um, it's standard in all Calc 1 classes. So this is, again, the last section where we're going to take all of the techniques we've learned so far and put them together, okay? The only thing we're really not going to do in the optimization portion is limits. We don't really have to do that here. Here we're really just going to be using derivatives in order to optimize things, right? Optimize situations. So this is definitely an applications portion of this course. Um, it's the application of all of our Calculus 1 stuff, right? So again, I've said this a few times, but optimization is super, super important in mathematics. Um, there are whole careers dedicated to optimization so it's a very very important um uh section that we're going to cover you do you come back to optimization a couple of times throughout your calculus sequence especially in calculus 3 there's a big portion um where we focus on optimization again but calculus 3 focuses on three dimensions so it kind of translates this optimization that we're doing now in two dimensions towards a three-dimensional um, sort of equivalent. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> this is basically just a bunch of word problems. Okay, um, word problems that need calculus to be solved. We again, we've actually done an example of this back when we're talking about economics in chapter, I think it was like 5.3 or something to that effect, where we were trying to optimize a profit function. Okay, so it's the same kind of methods we're going to be using. You can use the first derivative test or you can use the second derivative test for these type of problems. Whichever one is uh, your preference. So let's go ahead and go over the steps for solving these kinds of things. So it's still a word problem. So all of our rules that we use for word problems still kind of underlay the method, which is make sure you read the problem several times. Okay, that's always one of the important things, right? So we always read problem the problem several times. We make sure we draw our picture, if possible, uh, label things on our picture try to form some equations or some relationships after we label our picture and then once we have an equation that models our situation we need to optimize that um, that model that formula okay so again make sure we understand the problem that comes from reading the question carefully as you've seen me uh, go through these word problems before I read them several times right it just helps you to understand things so as you're reading ask yourself a few questions like what are the things that I don't know, right? The things that I don't know typically turn into variables. Or is something changing over time? That will uh, become a function of some sort, right? So what is the unknown? What are the values that are given to me? Are there any conditions? Such as, um, I'm talking about time, so it has to be positive. Or uh, the distance can't be more than... 30 feet, right? Or I only have 100 units to spend, so I can't spend a negative amount and I can't spend more than 100, right? Part two is we want to draw a diagram, right? As always, we want to draw a picture. Generally, when I draw a picture, I do this after the second or third time that I'm reading it. Um, identify where my given values from my uh, my proposition, right? The, the, the statement that they give us the given values should be labeled, right? So try to label those things. Um, part three is introduce notation. So if I have some unknowns, let's start to give them some symbols, right? So we can call those Q, the value that I want to maximize or minimize. Um, 
that could be the name of my function, right? Or maybe I need some A's and some B's, some L's, and some M's, X, Y's, or Z's, thetas, lambdas, whatever variables I need, right? So related terms are always easier, right? So A for area, H for height, things like that, okay? Make my expressions and equations out of this notation that I introduced. Okay. So we would use these to make a formula. So what we're gonna try to do is try to express Q, the thing that we wanna maximize or minimize in terms of these symbols, right? Um, I'm gonna find relationships between the expressions that I form. So let's say that Q um, is expressed as a multivariable function um, or a system of equations even, right? Then I want to try to form relationships between those and solve that system or uh, try to turn it from multiple variables into a single variable depending on the situation, right? The practical domain of Q is going to be very important. So um, I don't want to uh, find values of interest to me that are outside of values that make sense for the system, right? So again, like if I'm talking about a quantity of things, negative values don't make any sense to me. So I, I want to make sure I'm staying within my practical domain, okay? Uh, six is I want to find the global max and mins, right? So, so we want to make sure we're using that extreme value theorem to uh, know whether or not we're ch checking the smallest value in my practical domain and the largest value in my practical domain, as well as any of the critical values. So uh, we're gonna use the methods from 6.1 and 6.3. 6.1 was talking about the first derivative test and the closed interval test. Uh, 6.3 was the second derivative test. So both of those had to do with uh, finding max and min values, right? Um, be mindful of the domain, again, for the function that we want to maximize or minimize. So the, the domain of Q. So we can use the first derivative test for absolute extreme values. Um, this is the same as the closed interval method where we're using the first derivative test to find the critical values and then checking the bounds of the uh, practical domain. Uh, we can also use the second derivative test as well to check for uh, the local max and mins um, for our practical domain, right? So <clears throat> just to review what the first derivative test is, um, let's say that C is a critical number for a continuous function on an interval. Then if the first derivative is positive for every value that is less than C, and the first derivative is negative for every value that's larger than C, then C is an absolute maximum, meaning that it's at the top of the hill, right? Because rate of change here, um, positive slope means that we have a positive rate of change when I'm less than my value, and then I have a downward slope or a negative rate of change, a decreasing portion when I'm on the right of my function, okay? And then we just switch the signs to check to see if we are at an, uh, a minimum, okay? So we look at the derivative on one side and the derivative on the other side for it being positive or negative, okay? So let's do an example. So if we're offered one slice from a round pizza, and let's say that we have the condition that our slice has to have a perimeter of 32 inches for whatever reason, okay? What diameter of pizza will reward us with the largest slice, right? So here we don't know the size of our pizza, right? The diameter hasn't been given to us. We wanna know what diameter will give us slices with perimeters of 32 inches, but have the largest area, right? So I have a requirement for the, uh, I have a requirement for the perimeter. The diameter is unknown, right? So which means I don't know the radius of this circle, okay? If we just kind of relate this down to what it is, we're talking about a circle here. Um, I need to know what, per what radius basically, gives us a largest slice, right? So, but it's not asking for the radius, it's asking for the diameter. So even when I find R, I gotta make sure I answer my question and give my answer in terms of a diameter, right? So a slice of pizza, let's say it looks like this, then we know its perimeter is 32 inches, right? The length around. So I know that this is a radius. I know that this is a radius. I don't know what this is yet. Okay, how to find this. This is an unknown value. 
But there is a um, formula for this, which is the arc length, right? We know arc length is r times theta, or the radius times the angle formed here. Okay, so my perimeter is radius plus the radius plus radius times theta. I'm going to set this equal to 32, and I can factor out the r. Okay, so I don't know what the angle is, I don't know what the radius is, um, but I can talk about the area because that's what I want to maximize. I want the largest radius, I'm sorry, the largest area possible. Area of a slice is the same as the area of a sector of a circle, so that's one half theta r squared. So I have two uh, formulas now, okay? I got one for perimeter, one for area. The one that I want to maximize is the area. I know that here we're saying we're calling everything q, but it makes a lot more sense to call this area uh, a. So what I want to maximize is this value of a. Now, depending on my choice for radius, um, it's the r that's going to change. So that's my my unknown value here is the radius. Okay. I also don't know the angle, uh, so there's two unknowns. But we do have a system of equations. Okay. So I got 32 equals 2r plus r theta if I were to multiply this out. And I have the area is 1 half theta r squared. So let's go ahead and try to solve this system as best as we can. Let's substitute one into the other at least so I have one formula. Um, so R is what we want to find, right? Um, so we're going to find the R that works. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this first equation because A is what I want to maximize. So I'm going to take the perimeter formula and I'm going to solve it for theta. And if I solve it for theta, I can then plug it into my area of a sector of a circle, the thing I want to maximize, and I can then have a function for the area only in terms of r which is what i need and then i can start to differentiate it and maximize it and all the things i need to do right so i'm going to try to make a in terms of r only by eliminating theta by solving the first equation for theta and plugging it into the second so if i do that i get one half 32 minus 2r over r times r squared so if i solve this first equation together here for theta I can substitute it into a and have this formula this is nice because these two R's cancel so I end up with just one R on the outside I can simplify because half of 32 is 16 and half of 2 R is just one of these R's so it actually gives me a nice quadratic here a simplified version of uh, a here um, I can multiply this R and differentiate it which is probably pretty easy or I can use the product rule which is still easy, but a pain in the butt. So let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit. Um, note here that the practical domain here is 16 and zero because it doesn't make sense to have a negative area. So the smallest uh, radius I can have is zero because I can't have a negative radius. And the largest I can get is 16 because then that turns this whole equation into zero. So if I differentiate A with respect to R, okay, I get this is a negative r squared, so um, well, it looks like I can do the product rule. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just do the product rule here. It doesn't really matter because I'll get the same thing out. So a turns into the rate of change of a with respect to r. <clears throat> product rule here gives me negative r plus 16 minus r, or negative 2r plus 16, which is what I would have had if I multiplied this out into a polynomial form and then took the derivative, I would have got the negative 2r um, plus 16. So either way, that's what I get. Okay. So I got to check my critical values, right? So um, what makes this derivative 0 is the value 8. And then I got to check the lowest and the largest value from my practical domain. Okay. So if I check 0, I plug a uh, 0 into a, which again, 1 half uh, sorry, 16 minus r times r. We're not using this because I don't have a theta. I only want it in terms of r. So I'm going to plug it into here. So 16 minus r times r. So if I use uh, r is 0, I just get out 0. If I use r is 8, I get 16 minus 8, which is 8, times r, which is 8. So that's 8 times 8. And then times 16, I also get 0. Again, 
coming back here. Okay, if I plug in zero, I get zero. If I plug in 16, this goes to zero. So eight is the only one that's gonna give me any value other than zero. And plugging in eight gives me eight times eight. Okay. So therefore my max is eight. And the area when I plug in eight um, has a perimeter of 32, right? Cause that was part of the condition that I used to solve it. And so the diameter then is 16 inches, right? So 16 inches gives the maximum size slice when I have to have a perimeter of size 32 inches. All right, so let's do one more example. <clears throat> what is the minimum vertical distance between the parabolas y equals x squared plus one and y equals x minus x squared? So just having this in word form is not too bad to solve. Um, we can do it. It's always nice to have a picture, right? So x minus x squared um, looks like this, right? It's a concave down parabola. x squared plus 1 is a concave up parabola. And what I'm looking for is the location. Sorry, not the location, but the distance, the smallest distance between these. Obviously, here, the distance between the two is large. Here, it's small, but it's probably not the smallest. It's probably, it's definitely somewhere around here, okay? Somewhere around here. So notice that this is a concave down parabola that's shifted to the right by one. So somewhere in between zero and one is my guess for where the smallest distance between them occurs. So if we want to find distance between them, then the formula that I want to maximize, okay, I'm sorry, to minimize is the difference between the two, right? So the vertical distance between them is my difference in y value. So I take one equation and I subtract it from the other. Right, so the distance between one, x squared plus one is always larger, so I will subtract from that the one that's always smaller. This is the function I want to maximize. I'm sorry, this is the function I want to minimize. So let's simplify it down, okay, to two x squared minus x plus one. The domain is all of r here. There's no restrictions in the domain. The derivative is four x minus one. Uh, I can't check the smallest and largest values. Um, but I want to know when my derivative is equal to zero, right? So that's going to happen when x equals one fourth or 0 0.25. So that's the location where that's the maximum. Let's plug this into my distance, right? Because remember, this formula tells me the distance between the two. So I'm going to plug one fourth into the actual distance, distance equation and I get a distance of one. So the smallest distance between those two functions vertically uh, is 1, and that happens at x equals 1 fourth.